just um, point your attention to the schedule. My wife pointed out to me that uh, it is course, sort of a dream come true for me that I, I am having the opportunity to speak uh, in the 1040 window. So, <laughs> except uh, that window is quickly closing. It's already 1051, so I'd better get going here. Uh, really thankful to be able to address you again uh, here. And also very thankful to be able to follow right on the heels of that wonderful address by our brother uh, Jeremiah, because what I'm talking about fits very nicely with what um, our brother has just shared. And I'm sure you'll see our sort of cultural, our different cultural backgrounds in the way that we approach things, um, but I hope that they'll, they'll tie in together well. There it is. There we go. I want to start with a story about Jim and Upa. Jim's the, um, well, how shall I describe him? Um, in PNG, this would be perfectly politically correct to say Jim's the white skin and uh, Upa's the black skin with paint all over his face um, in that picture. And here's the story. Jim had been working with a certain people group in the highlands of Papua New Guinea for some 20 years translating scripture, and planting churches. During this time, he'd built many deep relationships, but none deeper than his relationship with Upa, who was the first man to join his translation team, had spent countless days, weeks, and months working closely with Jim, had been discipled by him, and matured to the point of becoming a pastor and a prominent evangelist in the area. Now it was time for Jim to leave and repatriate to his home country, after many tear-filled goodbyes and more thank-you meals than he dared to count, Jim stood with Upa near the small single-engine prop plane that would take him away from the village and away from Upa for good. Having prayed, wept, and embraced, Jim was turning to the plane when Upa caught his arm and turned him back to face him. Brother Jim, please, I know that you're leaving now and I'll never see you again. All these years I've worked with you and I've never asked you for anything, but now I have one request. Please, can you tell me the secret to your power? My power? Jim asked, mystified. Yes, yes, your, your power, your, your success, your cargo. Where does it come from? Where do you get it? How can I get it? You are like Elijah and I am Elisha and I want to know the secret to your power. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. I, I have to go now. I'm, just, just hold on to Christ, brother. Look to Christ and he will give you all you need. The last part, Jim yelled as the plane engine began to roar and Jim pulled away from Upa's grip to duck and jump into the plane for the last time. As the plane flew back, flew Jim back to his mission's headquarters, surrounded by a few boxes of goods that he was taking along with him. Jim was deeply troubled. He had worked with Upa for 20 years. They had suffered together. They had rejoiced together. They had studied scripture together. And now he would ask for the secret to his power, success, and cargo. How was this possible? It's a story that I heard. I sort of added some details to it, but a story that I heard soon after arriving in, in Papua New Guinea. It's quite a sad story. And this morning, I want to talk about how does this story happen? How does this story happen? How can we stop it from happening? And how is this story actually relevant to everyone here this morning? And the answer to that question, definitely the first question, how does this story happen, but in a way to every question, is this, it's about culture. It's about culture. It's helpful to think of culture as an, as an onion. There's various sort of pictorial ways of of thinking about culture, uh, the one that really always sticks with me is the, is the, the cultural onion model. 
And what you have in this model is, is a way of thinking about culture that sort of breaks things up a little bit. And um, what you have in a culture is you have on the surface layer, you have the things that you can see and that you can experience in some way or another. It's the sensory level. It's those aspects of a society or an organization that, that you experience through your senses, what you observe in the culture, things like art, things like behaviors, things like, like smells even, signs, rituals, all those things. It's, it's the first thing that strikes you when you, you land in the plane at the airport, and, and all these new experiences are hitting you, that's the sensory level. And you'll continue to experience that level um, as you remain in the culture. But culture has more than just what you can see. Underneath and informing that, that sensory level are the beliefs and values that that culture holds. Every group has a culture, every group has ideas and convictions about what's good and what's bad, what's clean and what's dirty or, or what's unclean, what's dangerous and, and what's safe. And many anthropologists will sort of stop there and they'll say that's the deepest layer of culture, but many, especially Christian anthropologists, will dig deeper and notice that there's another layer underneath that that's actually informing why some things are good and why some things are bad. And that's the level of, um, of worldview. Worldview explains the beliefs and convictions. Worldview is those, are those untested assumptions and presuppositions that a group has. And for many people, for, for most people, these are unconscious. They're not aware of these assumptions or these presuppositions. They're almost never discussed. Why? Because everybody holds them in common. You don't need to talk about them. They're the things that are just true. They're just there. They're, they're like, like from that, that story, I don't know if you've ever uh, listened to David Foster Wallace, um, but he talks about the story about two fish swimming in water, and the two fish are swimming along, and, and there's this older fish that comes swimming the other way, and, and uh, the older fish says, morning boys, nice day for a swim in the water, isn't it? And he keeps swimming along. And then the two fish keep swimming along, and then all of a sudden they stop, and they look at each other, and the one fish says to the other one, water? They've never thought about anything else, other, that there's anything other than water. In the Jim and Upa story, worldview is what explains that the vast gulf that's been exposed between Jim's understanding of the purpose of the Christian life and Upa's. So what is it in Upa's uh, worldview that has caused him to have such a, a, a different understanding of the purpose of the Christian life I suggest, I think, it's what anthropologists have described for the last hundred years or so in looking at animistic and specifically in, in South, the South Pacific region like Papua New Guinea, a concept called manna. Here you have a definition, I think from um, around 1900 or so, 1891, of manna. I'll just go through this quickly says it's a power or an influence, not physical, and in a way supernatural, but it shows itself in physical force or in any kind of power or excellence which a man possesses. This man is not fixed in anything, but can be conveyed in almost anything. But spirits, whether disembodied souls or supernatural beings, have it and can impart it, and it essentially belongs to personal beings to originate it, though it may act through the medium of water or a stone or a bone. All Melanesian religion consists in getting manna for oneself or getting it used for one's benefit. All religion, that is, as far as religious practices go, prayers and sacrifices. This resonates with what um, Brother Jeremiah was just speaking of in an African context. 
So what is this manna? It's part of the holistic uh, Melanesian worldview, which like an African worldview is where the, the, the physical and the spiritual are, are sort of meshed together and all intertwined. Western, a Western worldview is, is, is a dialectic, is, is we like to break things apart. That doesn't happen in a Melanesian worldview. And, and their idea is that this force is infused in, in both natural objects and, and living beings. So, but it's especially like a, like a strange looking rock, like a precious rock or, or, or a really large, healthy looking tree. That sort of thing would, would seem to be would be viewed as a medium for gaining manna. It's a, it's a dynamic force that ebbs and flows, it comes and goes, and, and it's gained mostly through proximity. So you get close to those sources of manna, and you can gain some for yourself. It's held in balance, especially through relationship. And so you have to have good relationships with other people. You have to have good relationships with with. The, the, the world around you, both physical and spiritual. And the goal, of course, as, as stated here, is to accumulate this manna, to gain it for yourself. People with large stores of manna are seen to be living the good life. That, and that's the goal, to live the good life. And finally, rituals are really important in gaining positive manna. But you can also use rituals like witchcraft in a negative way, to harm others. And it's all part of that manna dynamic. So two quick stories from PNG from my experience. Um, the first was told me when I was, we were in the Highlands region on a preaching tour. And we were in a village, and someone from that village was telling me about a, a really prosperous pig farmer from, from a previous generation who had lived in that village. And they said, this man had found a rock that this area actually has lots of precious metals and people are finding them all the time. They'd found a large stone of precious metal of, of some kind and they, this man recognized the power in this and so he took it home and, and he, he saw immediately that, that this, would, this was full of manna and so he put it with his pigs so that his, his pig herd would grow and pigs are, are very important in, in Papua New Guinean society. And other people saw the value of this stone too. So what they would do is they would rent the stone from the man. So they would give him a piglet and he would, they, would, he, they would use his stone for a while to help their own pig farms. And then he would get the stone back and then he would exchange it for another piglet. And people noticed that this man's pig herd just grew. It, it grew and grew and grew. He had all these pigs and, and in their mind, it was obvious the source of, of this man's wealth was the stone. Another, um, another story, in the region uh, where we have one of our church plants, a rural region, this area cooks with clay pots. They're sort of famous throughout P&G for their clay pots. They still make them and eat with them today. And a local man from that area told me, he said, you know, we never sell our clay pots. And I was very impressed with this. I thought, wow, this man is not greedy. They have this, this, this thing about exchanging and, and not, not wanting to, to, to use this to their, uh, their advantage and be greedy. But then he went on and he said, no, because people across the road, they started selling their clay pots. And you know what happened? Their deposits of clay dried up. They couldn't sell their clay pots anymore. And so clearly in this man's mind, it was, it was their greed and their, their lack of maintaining this, this balanced relationship with the clay that led to the drying up of those clay pot deposits. In the same way that I see manna, that manna thinking at the root of those two stories, I see it at the root of the Upa and Jim story. So the question is, how does knowing that, that manna, this, this idea, is there, how does that help us communicate cross-culturally? And specifically, how does that help us to communicate Christ cross-culturally? So there's a few different models for communicating Christ that, ha that have been used, especially in the South Pacific areas like Papua New Guinea. Um, these models are, are present even today. The first one is called the power encounter. Very simply with this one, 
with this approach, you, you come, you come into an, an area, and you demonstrate that the power of the Christian God is greater than the power of the traditional or ancestral gods or spirits. And this approach has been predominant, as, as it's sort of grown out of the South Pacific uh, region. It's often associated with signs and wonders movements, so that, so that through prayer and through other means, um, you will, you will, God will demonstrate signs and wonders, demonstrate His power. People will see these signs and wonders, see the power of the Christian God, put their faith in Him, and become Christians. Even today, all around the world, this approach is being taken, is being used by Pentecostal missions. Um, historically, it's been the approach by many others. Uh, it's been used by many others as well, including Roman Catholics and Evangelicals. And, and it's been extremely successful in the South Pacific. And I, that's how you get these numbers, like in Papua New Guinea, which is 92% Christian, or Solomon Islands, which is about 90% Christian, and other islands in the area that where sort of everyone is Christian. But if you dig a little deeper, you see that this, this approach has been utterly unsuccessful in affecting the culture, in getting people to actually change their, their lives. Why? Because it only deals with that sensory level of culture. So the Roman Catholic approach has been to simply convert the culture by changing those, those sensory forms. So you, you, you give them baptism and mass and holy water, and, and those things become the means for accessing manna. The two pastors that I work with in PNG grew up in a Roman Catholic area, and, and this was religion to them. It was essentially that quest for manna, but it was accessed through these sort of Christian means, um, through what could be seen and, and tasted and touched. For Pentecostals, it's not baptism and mass so much as being baptized by the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, ecstatic prayer, other demonstrations of the Spirit's powers. Those become the means to accessing manna. And the prosperity gospel is at the moment in, in that area of the world is, is taking over the Christian church. And you can see how well the prosperity gospel teaching fits with this manna animistic worldview. Perform certain rituals for God and He'll bless you. So that's one encounter, that's one approach, but it's, it's been unsuccessful at reaching the heart or reaching the worldview of Melanesian culture, in my opinion. A second approach is the truth encounter. And for, this is sort of the classic cons conservative approach to preaching Christ cross-culturally. Um, one missiologist uh, outlines this approach in a, a book on communicating Christ in animistic con contexts, and he says that this approach is basically, well, he doesn't call it the truth encounter, but I've sort of labeled it for him. But he says this is how we should communicate the, the gospel. He says we should communicate the truth of the gospel, that's the first. He says we should um, teach the biblical concept of power. And so we want to we wanna fix. Melanesians have this, this wrong understanding of power, and so we want to give them the right understanding of power. We want to teach a biblical concept of power. And third, we need to affirm that the blessing of the Christian life is, is otherworldly. It's not the same as, as manna. So what, what the promises that the Bible gives are different, and we need to show how they're different from what manna is, is sort of pursuing. I think this approach is good. He says good things about how to communicate Christ in the culture. But especially from, from my experience, um, but also sort of examining this maybe a little deeper, and it helps having your feet on the ground in a country like P&G, you realize that this approach as well, it, it, it comes up short. And one of the biggest reasons why this comes up short is simply the dynamic that's inherent between a Western missionary teaching these things and Melanesians who are receiving these things. 
And that is that if I come in as a Western missionary with access to money, with sort of this sense of, of power and this, what you know, people have referred to as the God complex of a Westerner, I'm immediately perceived as a source of manna myself. And so the, the typical Melanesian will sort of want to latch on to someone like, a, like myself, like a Western missionary, and, and take in all those beliefs and values and rituals and symbols and all those things, whatever I communicate, but the worldview stays the same. Another problem is, is basically how to transform. So um, one missiologist, Christian missiologist, uh, by the name of Hebert, last name Hebert, he gives an approach to transforming worldviews. He's written a book called Transforming Worldviews. And he ultimately says that what needs to happen with these worldviews is that we need to bring them to the, uh, the level of consciousness so that those who, who hold this worldview can critically reflect on them. And again, that, that's a good approach. But I think ultimately it falls short, especially if you, if you, if you think of how was the gospel communicated um, by Christ and, and by the apostles. I don't know that you would say that what they were doing was helping their hearers to have their worldviews raised to a level of consciousness and then helping them to critically reflect on them. I think is much more pointed than that. And so I'd like to uh, introduce what I call the rebuke encounter. What I think is missing in a lot of missiology today, or certainly what I read about communicating Christ in an animistic culture, is what we can find in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It's a very familiar passage to everyone here, I'm sure. And, that, and it says there, the Apostle Paul says there, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, if you think about that truth encounter, you have the teaching you have the correction, you have the training in righteousness, but what's missing is, is the reproof or the rebuke, as it's translated in the NIV. Now, that word for rebuking comes from a difficult to pronounce Greek word, elenkos, um, which means to expose or convict. And, and this was precisely, actually, the, the method of communicating the gospel that was proposed by J.H. Bavink, the Dutch missiologist from the mid-1900s, who took, actually, this, this method of rebuke as his starting point and the most essential aspect of missiological communication to the point that he named his approach elenctics. I'm not sure that that's the I wish you would have named it something else. It hasn't caught on in missiological circles, perhaps because of how he's named it. But listen to what Bavink says about the main thrust of the Bible. He says, the Bible is from the first page to the last, a tremendous plea against the heathenism, against the paganizing tendencies in Israel itself, in short, against the corruption of religion. And he's saying that if that's what God's word is doing in its communication, then that's what we need to be doing in our communication. Our communication needs to be that plea against heathenism and against the paganizing tendencies of man. And it's not hard to find examples in Scripture of this. Just think of how Jesus, the Lord Jesus, communicated. Now, it's true that he was communicating in a, in a cultural way which, which was indirect, he was telling parables, but through his parables, he was, and, and anyone, of course, who's done any study of, of the parables of the Lord Jesus, realizes just how, how pointedly he was critiquing and exposing and rebuking the worldview of the prevalent culture, first century Judaism, the, the dominant worldview of his day. Or think of how the apostles communicated. Think of how, how Peter, when he took the, the gospel, you could say cross-culturally, to Samaria. And he was met with, with a, another, the, the worldview of, of Simon the magician. And Simon the magician says, 
I want the source of this power. And Peter doesn't sit back and say, well, let's raise your worldview to the level of consciousness and let's critically reflect on it together. What does he do? He rebukes Simon. And he, and he, he shows to him the idolatry of his thinking, of, of his, his feeling, of his, his worldview. And he calls him to repentance and to pray for forgiveness. So how does this apply to a Melanesian worldview? Well, just to cut it short, um, it means that the missionary, what the missionary needs to do, or, or anyone communicating in that culture needs to do, is to expose the selfishness, the greed, the idolatry that's, that's basic to the worldview. It means that he's got a lot of work to do because you don't find this in books. You, you, you observe this in the culture. He needs to see what's being done. So he needs to look at that, the outside level of, of the culture and, and he needs to work from those behaviors down to the beliefs and values and down to the worldview. And understanding that, he needs to expose it and he needs to rebuke that. Now, that's in a sense easily said, but you know, how is that done? Well, since doing work on this, especially for myself in Papua New Guinea, I think for the past one and a half years or so, um, it's, it's, I think, I hope, made my preaching more effective. I've realized that persuasion actually isn't the goal of my preaching. Now, there is an element, of course, of persuasion. But since doing this study, I've, I've recognized that what I need to do is, is, is it's a call to repentance and faith. And so I, I feel more free when I'm preaching to, to call sin, sin, and to call for repentance, and to boldly preach Christ, to simply say that this is, is, is idolatry, this is wrong. So, just a quick example, um, preaching on marriage. In the past year, we did a lot of preaching on marriage in the markets. And when it came to the point of, of conviction, what I simply tried to do was follow that cultural onion. So, I described what I observed. Men are beating their wives. And then I would deal with beliefs and convictions. That one of those beliefs is that men own their wives, and so they can beat them. And many people will stop there, and they'll say, They'll say, well, you don't own your wife, and so you can't beat her. End of story. But what I tried to do was to go deeper than that and, and to go to the level of worldview and to, to expose to men that, that their worldview is, is, elevating, is anti-God. What they are doing is elevating themselves to the position of God. And they're acting wickedly. They're acting against Him. God will not stand to have others take His place in the lives of anyone. So you can say, you don't own your wife. But then you also need to say, well, who is it that owns your wife? As Bavink uh, um, would frequently say, he would say, what did you do with God? What did you do with God? Where is God in that situation? You are making yourself God. Now, thankfully, in that culture, that, which, which does have a conscience, um, the rebuke often lands. But what I want to do very, very quickly now here is, um, is to say, now, how did we get here? Just a question. What was that timer at? Was that, did that start at 40? 30. Do I have 30 or 40? I was under the impression I had 40. You can take 40, that's fine. All right. Sorry. <laughs> this is a very Western conversation we're having up here. <laughs> In PNG, I don't ask those kind of questions. <laughs> okay, so I can slow down a little bit then. Um, I started to think, now, why is it that all these missiologists... And why is it that if, if you think about preaching today, even in the West, why is it that this aspect of rebuke is missing? 
And I think it's got to do with culture. I'm pretty convinced, I'm, I'm convinced it has to do with culture. I'm not sure what aspect of the culture it is that's causing this, but I'm quite sure it's culture that's, that's dictating this. Perhaps it's that, that Western ideal of niceness, wherever that comes from. Maybe it's a Pelagian view of, of the nature of man. Maybe it's just sort of a natural aversion to calling someone a sinner, a romantic view of love, a warped view of tolerance, postmodern devaluing of the truth. I'm not sure. Something in our worldview makes this a blind spot for us. In the Atlantic approach, then, what we need is rebuke. We have to realize that God's Word tells us that we're wrong. If we lose the priority of rebuke in our gospel communication, then we lose the gospel. In Romans 1, Paul, the great cross-cultural communicator, tells us to expect false worship from everyone who doesn't live by faith. And so we should expect when we're communicating the gospel that we will be exposing that false worship. And in fact, in Romans, as he goes on through chapter 2 into chapter 3, he he exposes that we all stand in need of rebuke, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one can boast before the throne of God. For the communication of the gospel, this is powerful. In the rebuke encounter, it's God's truth rebuking both of us, all of us, regardless of our culture, for our sin. What I love about, about this this sort of framework, or how it's really helped me too, is to see that it's not me over some, you know, sort of Western culture working over against another culture, imposing itself on another culture. Biblical missional communication allows for no forms of cultural arrogance, because we all stand in need of rebuke. And as I rebuke the sins in the Melanesian culture, My brothers and sisters who are living close to me and working with me can rebuke my sins, the ones that I'm not aware of because they're like water to me. And so I hope you see that Alenktix isn't only useful for bringing the gospel somewhere else. Now, I'm I haven't sort of gone back to Bavink to check this, but he's talking about this in the, in the context of you're going to another culture and what, how are you communicating the gospel there? But I would say if it's true communicating the gospel there, then it's also true communicating the gospel here. If the Bible is a plea against heathenism, and he even says it against the paganizing tendencies of the Israelites of the people of God, then it's also pleading against the heathenism of 21st century Western culture and the paganizing tendencies within the church as well. And I think we get that on the macro level. We get that with things in our culture like abortion, homosexuality. We see how there's worldview issues at work there and and I think we're quite good at exposing those. But of course, the the problem with with worldview is always that we're blind to our own. As a subculture, Canadian Reformed churches or OPC churches, URC churches, we have our own culture and we have our own worldview and and we have our own uh, understandings that are basic and that that we we just accept as, as true. I think one of, the, one of the ones that we can think about is, is the, that, that drive to succeed. We, we see success as, a, as an ideal, as a good thing. It's always a good thing. And so we have this drivenness, and, and we applaud drivenness. And people who are driven, we make them the board chair, and, and we make them elders, and, and we, we, we honor them as successful pastors and good students. But if you dig deeper into that drivenness and you start asking, now where is God in that drivenness? It's like Bavink would say, what did you do with God 
How does God fit in with that? Are are we putting ourselves in his place, believing that things are going to happen by our might and our power? Is that what's describing what's happening on the outside of that onion? Or or is that driven as an attempt to please God, to earn his commendation of approval? I would suggest that the godly person who's driven is constantly driven to their knees in sorrow and repentance and childlike faith and submission to God's will. See, what our culture dictates as as good is not necessarily good and needs to be rebuked. How often are we thinking along these lines? I hope that, in a way, this presentation can help us to not only think critically on those things, but to rebuke and to be rebuked. Now, I want to go back to Jim and Upa for a moment, and I want to ask the question, what could Jim have said to Upa? Of course, it's an awkward time. He doesn't have a lot, you know, he's about to jump on a plane. But, but how could he react in that moment if he was sort of ready for this rebuke encounter? Well, if he had just finished reading Bavink, he might have said to his brother, My brother in Christ, Satan is trying to deceive you. If you're seeking worldly success and riches, then you're not a true servant of Christ. Christ became poor that to give us the riches of the new heavens and the new earth. Christ suffered that we should follow in his steps. Remember what Christ said when Satan offered him all the kingdoms of this world? Worship God alone. My brother Upa, whom I love as a child, your old ways of seeking the secrets to wealth and power have come back. You need to put them to death. You need to repent if you truly want to live. I need to, be, to learn to be content with what the Lord gives me. And so do you. Whether plenty or hunger, abundance or need. Brother, may Christ strengthen you. Worship God. Goodbye. But now I'd like to just put a little a bit of a different spin on it. I'd like to imagine if, if Upa came and served as a missionary in Canada... So Upa had come from Papua New Guinea, served as a missionary in post-Christian Canada, served faithfully for 20 years, and now he was going to return to his Melanesian culture. As he was at the airport, his best friend Jim, a man 10 years younger than him, whom he had mentored in the ways of the Lord, clutched him by the sleeve and he said, Upa, I'm really worried about you leaving. You've done great work with us, but I've got to tell you, I've been staying up all night worrying and wondering how we're going to do it when you're gone. You didn't leave us with a contingency plan, a transition plan, a series of next steps that we could follow when you leave. I feel like you're abandoning us. I need to pastor these people, Upa, but I don't know how. Please, Upa, before you go, can you tell me your secret to success? How can you be so calm and relaxed when there's so many things to worry about? Please tell me so our church won't fall apart. What's going on there? What's the worldview that that Jim is holding to? What's informing what he's saying? How should Upa respond? Thank you.